Hey guys, so the night sky has captivated humanity since the ancient times with its vastness and mystery. Uncontained curiosity has always made people study new areas and discover distant things. And in the end, the thirst for knowledge and technological progress took humanity farther than our home planet. So in the fall of 1977, an unprecedented event happened that became a worldwide sensation. Two twin probes called Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 were launched into space with a difference of 16 days between them. Each was given a mission. Now, Voyager 1 was to study Jupiter and Saturn, and Voyager 2 was to study Uranus and Neptune. Astronomers didn't limit the research mission and equipped the probes with gold records with Earth messages for alien ears. So the launch of the Large Space Probe program caused a storm of various emotions. Some awaited exciting discoveries. Others thought the messages on the Voyagers might be a threat for humanity since the probes might run into an aggressive alien civilization on the other side of space. And in 1979, Voyager 2 was very close to Jupiter and let scientists obtain indirect data on the existence of a liquid ocean under the surface of its moon, Europa. When Voyager 2 reached Saturn, it obtained data on the gas giant's temperature and magnetic field, and also discovered several previously unknown moons. It also took many pictures of both Saturn and its rings. Now, in 1986, the probe flew past Uranus and past Neptune, later in 1989. It also obtained many unique pictures and discovered 17 moons and ring systems around both planets. Now, the gravitational influence of Neptune changed Voyager 2's trajectory, making it leave its ecliptic plane. So the probe lost its chance to approach other objects in the solar system. However, it hadn't run out of opportunities quite yet. On December 10th, 2018, the probe reached the heliopause and entered interstellar space. So why did the probe lose contact for a year? And what incredible scientific discoveries did it make? Well, keep watching and you'll find out. So the Global International Network of Deep Space Communication at NASA is made up of three complexes capable of guiding the probes in interstellar space. It includes the, Mar it includes the Madrid Deep Space Communication Complex in Spain, the Goldstone Observatory in the USA, and the Antenna System in Canberra, Australia. They are made up of huge radar telescopes with super powerful transmitters and super sensitive receivers. However, Earth has only one NASA deep space communication complex capable of maintaining contact with Voyager 2 that has left the solar system. So, what's the problem? All interplanetary devices move near the ecliptic plane and are in the visibility zones of all three NASA deep space communication observatories. However, Voyager 2 became an exception to this rule. To approach Triton, Neptune's largest moon, the probe flew over the North Pole, and this maneuver caused its trajectory to move so far south that the antennae in Earth's northern hemisphere lost connection since it fell out of their visibility zones. Now, because of the specifics with limited visibility in the southern sky, maintaining contact with Voyager 2 in interstellar space is only possible from the Australian Observatory. Its antenna system has a fully rotating parabolic 70-meter or 230-foot DSS-43 antenna weighing over 3,000 tons, made up of 1,272 aluminum panels, 4,180 meters squared in area, 45,000 square feet. Deep Space Station 43 was opened in 1973. Its original diameter was 64 meters, 210 feet, but was expanded to 70 meters, 230 feet in 1987. Now, it's the only antenna that can be used to observe Voyager 2 18.8 billion kilometers from the Sun. During its operation, the NASA equipment has aged and the amount of space devices has increased while their missions have gotten more complex, of course. So, this made remodeling and modernizing the only antenna that can maintain contact with Voyager 2 necessary. So, on March 4, 2020, NASA announced they had begun a planned redesign of the Australian Deep Space Communication Complex in Canberra and modernization of the 70-meter, 
DSS-43 antenna. Now, during planned technical work, they installed two new radar transmitters that work in the S range, improved the electrical system, improved the cooling system, and updated the electronics. It was all very professional. The scientists hoped that they could receive signals from Voyager 2 during this time using the other three auxiliary Australian parabolic DSS antennae. They could provide the telemetry reception, however, in case of an incident, the mission specialists couldn't keep the probe safe or fix any problems in extreme situations. All they could do is hope that the probe's 40-year-old onboard computer system could independently solve any emergencies. Now, on October 29, 2020, mission operators were testing the modernized equipment and sent their lost deep space probe a series of commands. And voila! Voyager 2 accepted them and sent a response to Earth. This confirmed connection was back. The first data received from the probe became sensational discoveries. We had information on what was located at the edge of the heliosphere, the so-called circumsolar bubble, and interstellar space. Remember, space outside the solar system isn't a 100% pure vacuum. It has interstellar compounds like plasma, gas, and space debris left from the Big Bang's relic radiation. The sun is also both the source of electromagnetic waves and solar wind. The circumsolar space is where the sun's magnetic field and solar wind spread, and is called the heliosphere. It is, roughly speaking, a giant bubble. Outside it is the heliosphere mantle that has limited solar wind, and its movement becomes very turbulent. Now, outside the mantle is the heliopause. This is what separates the heliosphere from interstellar space. The first data on what happens in the heliopause was given to Earth by Voyager 1. It turns out that the direction of magnetic fields inside and outside the heliopause are about the same. Now, before that, astrophysicists thought that the magnetic field dominating the plasma of interstellar space would move in the other direction or would be chaotic in its movement. Mission Works then even doubted that Voyager 1 had crossed the border. The information was inexact since the equipment on the first probe malfunctioned back in 1980, and all hope was on Voyager 2, which had corrected and more accurate plasma measuring devices on board. The second probe really measured the thickness and accurately determined the temperature of the plasma outside the heliopause, which was exactly 35,000 Kelvin. It was also able to measure the concentration of protons in the boiling interstellar plasma and the magnetic field outside the heliopause. Now we definitely know what's on the border and outside the solar system. One of the most interesting discoveries was that the heliopause is significantly closer than the previous calculations proposed. We were able to determine the level of radiation in interstellar space at three to four times higher than in the circumsolar bubble of the heliosphere. The surprise was that the heliopause has a heterogeneous structure in various areas of the heliosphere and of varying thickness. This was explained thanks to Voyager 1 crossing the heliophase in the northern hemisphere of the heliosphere and Voyager 2 in the southern hemisphere. Previously, we thought that solar wind didn't cross past the heliopause and that interstellar plasma didn't come in. But Voyager 2 showed that the border between the southern part of the heliosphere and interstellar space has holes through which plasma bubbles from the solar system flow into open space. There seems to be a currently unknown principle of cosmic magnetism that controls the behavior of magnetic fields in space. This is shown by the holes in the solar system bubble and the direction of magnetic fields at the border of the heliosphere and interstellar space. So we're going to continue following the journey of these probes so we don't miss out on their new discoveries that could turn our world's way of viewing space upside down in the near future. But that is all for today. Be sure to leave a like, comment, let me know something that you learned in this video that was really interesting. I mean, for me, it was all of it. And I'll see you again next time.